वसुदेवासुत कंसचाणूरमर्दनम देवकी परमानंदम कृष्णम वंदे जगद्गुरु Jayant is our co-host this evening, and uh, he will let in people as uh, they come in. And also, you can give your comments and questions in the chat box, which we will look at first, and raise your hands if you want to interact directly. All right. So we have completed chapter six. Before I start chapter seven, I'll just make. Um, an observation the bhagavad gita has 18 chapters and so it is customary in the vedanta tradition to divide these 18 chapters into three groups of six chapters each in sanskrit a group of six is called shatakam like um, nirvana shatakam and you know we will sing manobuddhya hankara chittani nam chidananda rupa shivoham six why is it called shatakam because there are six verses in nirvana shatakam so like that three shatakams that means three groups of six or three sets of six chapters uh, chapter 1 to 6 is the first set then chapter 7 to 12 is the second set and chapter 13 to 18 is the third set what is the importance or significance of these sets well in our tradition in advaita vedanta tradition these are supposed to represent the mahavakya tattva masi we know in advaita vedanta the whole of the teaching can actually be reduced to one sentence and that is that thou art you are the ultimate reality now that sentence which is taken from the uh, chandogya upanishad sixth chapter of the chandogya upanishad which is called a mahavakya it this has three words one is tat that the other one is tvam you and asi which is an identity you are that now you here refers to the individual like you or me and or anybody else here the individual being that tat refers here uh, to god to saguna brahman ishwara the god which is worshiped in religion and is asi means is is a is an equivalence uh, not equivalence is identity actually it says you and god are identical and when you put it like that that sentence is very paradoxical very obviously i am not uh, identical to god if you say i am the servant of the lord oh all right i understand i am the child of the lord i understand um i am a part of the um, of the divine whole all right that also seems reasonable but i am god literally identically you are god and god is you that's it when i say tattvamasi you are god it literally means you are nothing but god and god is you that means other than you there is no brahma vishnu maheshwara there is no god in father in heaven no allah and nothing it is it is actually you so it's a very stunning uh, and paradoxical statement now those of us we have studied um, how to analyze this statement we have seen in vedanta sar for example there's a whole detailed discussion in fact the whole of vedanta sar is a build up to the analysis of this statement mahavakya artha vichara meaning analysis of the meaning of the mahavakya there we of course see the solution to this paradox that it's not actually a paradox we uh, we are first we investigate who am i and we realize i am actually not the body not the mind if i am not the body and the mind then i am not this limited personality this limited personality i am a man or a woman this person indian or american um, white or brown or black all of this is body a uh, happy person sad person intelligent or learned um, uh, you know me- mediocre talented all that is mind so all those things are there but beyond that um, illumining all of that is this witness consciousness which i am so this will be the result of the analysis of tvam of of you this is called tvam padartha shodhana in uh, classical vedanta advaita vedanta and there are 
procedures for this analysis, procedures like Drig Drishya Viveka, the discernment of the seer and the seen, or procedure like Pancha Kosha Viveka, the analysis investigation into the five levels of our personality, or Avastha Traya Vichara, the investigation into the three states of waking, dreaming, deep sleep. All of that is Twampada uh, Shodhana, analysis of what we are. Of course, I, I, um, along with that, in traditional Vedantic teaching, the Tatpada, the analysis of what is God is also done. So, Ultimately, we will see what is God also is nothing other than that one pure consciousness, one limitless consciousness associated with a fragment of Maya, with uh, a little bit of the darkness of ignorance is us, the individual sentient being. That one infinite consciousness associated with the entire gamut, the whole spectrum of the power of Maya uh, is God, Ishwara. But that one underlying consciousness is exactly the same. We are not part of it or um, that is not the whole, we are not part. No, you are that limitless consciousness and that limitless consciousness is exactly you. So this is the meaning. Now, how is it related to the Bhagavad Gita? The tradition holds that the first six chapters are Tvam Pada Pradhana. Um, the the uh, uh, they concentrate on you, the term Tvam, you. Where, where is this term you? Not in an ordinary sentence. In that thou art or you are that. In, in that sentence, Tat Tvamasi. That is chapter 1 to 6. Then chapter 7 to 12 concentrates on Tat, God, Ishwara, Saguna Brahman, Brahman with attributes. The God of religion, the God who is Shiva or Vishnu or the Divine Mother, Durga, Kali, uh, Mahalakshmi, uh, uh, is, is uh, the, uh, the God of the Muslims, the God of the Christians, the God of the, of the Jews, of the Zoroastrians. All the theistic religions, they worship God. And that God is, the, uh, is meant by the term Tat, that. So that is from chapter 7 to chapter 12, deals with that, God. And then chapter 13 to 18 is um, mainly concerned with establishing the identity of that thou art, that, that identity, you are that. So this is how the Gita is viewed. This is one paradigm. Uh, I am, you might notice, I'm not directly saying it. I'm just saying the tradition holds this. This is how it can be seen. This is a paradigm. Um, because uh, it is, it's a general statement. It's not exactly true. So, for example, in the first six chapters, definitely the em emphasis was on self-inquiry. Um, no doubt about it. In the first six chapters, we saw Krishna telling Arjuna about who he really is. Not this person Arjuna, but the Atma. In the second chapter, the nature of the Atman, the self, it is neither born nor does it die. Uh, it is uh, not an object, aprameya, not an object of knowledge. It is the, the subject, the pure consciousness. Um, it is not the doer. It is not the, uh, the sufferer of the results of karma. All of this was discussed, was stated straight away by Krishna. When he first started teaching, he taught the direct truth about the Atman. Also, practices which are necessary for the self-inquiry, those were also taught. Specifically, karma yoga. Karma yoga is very important for purification of the mind. So, Sri Krishna gave enormous importance of karma yoga in the second chapter, third chapter, you know, fourth chapter. So, jnana yoga was taught, karma yoga was taught. And in the sixth chapter, we saw dhyana yoga, raja yoga is taught. And the emphasis all along, all throughout, you can see a broad emphasis on Analysis of the self. Who am I? Inquiry. Or in the terms of the, the great statement that thou art, the concentration is on tvam, thou, you. But, but, you can also point out, didn't Krishna reveal himself as the avatar, uh, God, and uh, the incarnation of God? All that has already been um, mentioned. 
so it is uh, it is true um, even bhakti god avatar all these things have also also been mentioned in the first six chapters in the second um, set of six chapters 7th to 12th you will see the emphasis will be on god so from right away from the beginning of the seventh chapter suddenly you'll see a theme has shifted it's no longer meditation on the witness consciousness now it's meditation on god krishna says i am uh, the uh, god of the universe i am an incarnation of god and in my nature as a god of the universe i am the creator preserver and destroyer of all of the universe and by meditation upon me and devotion to me you will attain to the goal of human life so immediately god is introduced the powers of god are introduced the glories of god are introduced then the practice you'll see the practice will not shift earlier what was the practice emphasis was on karma yoga on vedanta inquiry gyan nature of atma on meditation now the practice will be devotion bhakti in fact one full chapter 12th chapter will be bhakti only the superiority of bhakti over all other practices so 7 to 12 is um discussion of tat the uh, discussion of god and then from um 13 to 18 again the core vedantic truth that you are actually pure consciousness god is also actually pure consciousness and in that sense you are one and many many other uh, topics will be discussed uh, so just to say that chapter 13 to 18 is only about you are god that uh, identity not really so things like exercise and food and uh, sleep and uh, uh, and uh, different natures of you know rajasik tamasik satvik people uh, the asura daiva the demoniac type the uh, the godly type all those things will be discussed um, morals and ethical life all those things will be discussed so vast amount of material will be covered in the last six chapters so that's what we have got right now we have got god and devotion to god surrender to god um uh, the power of the grace of god it's a very important thing uh, kripa i'll take prabir babu's uh, question and then i'll deal with the question is it necessary is worship of god is faith in god necessary just today somebody was asking me just a little while ago somebody who is very committed to advaita vedanta and was asking is it actually necessary to you know be devoted to god or believe in god and all that all right pravir babu all right <clears throat> pranam i want to ask you, you have to un- just uh, one second sorry sorry yes uh, we just finished a chapter on meditation where does shravana manana nididashana fit into what we just studied it is from an i'm answering from an advaitic paradigm yeah that's what um, i wanted what, because we studied meditation in aprokshana aprokshana yeah. also so yeah. i'm just trying to it's the same thing yeah. what what actually krishna means here in the 6th chapter is actually vedantic nididhyasana after ascertaining the nature of the self in the second chapter talking about the purifying effect of karma yoga uh, then you sit down and stay with it and how do you do that vedantic nididhyasana is taught in 6th chapter again i am giving an advaitic interpretation to the whole thing yes good now and that's also an interesting thing the meditation that in sixth chapter he has start is advaitic nididhyasan uh, you know i am the witness consciousness stay with it but from now on the practices he'll talk about are devotion to god and meditation on god on the form of god on the name of god um which many of us we have been initiated ishta devata ishta mantra all those things will be in this next six chapters now is it necessary i have mentioned earlier also broadly speaking there are two kinds of religion by religion here i mean the higher spirituality there are two approaches to being spiritual one is the that oriented approach and the other one is the tha oriented approach the tat oriented approach and the tvam oriented approach the tat oriented approach means and each of them has its um, uh, likes uh, is it is it positive and negative points and all of us who are sitting here our tendencies are more or less towards one side or the other you will see right now you will be able to identify 
um, the tat oriented religions are the theistic religions god based religions examples are um, christianity are most obviously here we are very close to uh, christmas judaism islam so all the abrahamic religions are god oriented religions and in fact that is so common here in the west that people think that is religion so what else could be religion but in india we know that there can be an entirely different kind of religion which is not god based at all uh, you see buddhism immediately comes to mind they either have no interest in god do not talk about god or are actively they say that there is no such thing as god so it's not a god based religion and not buddhism is not a unique thing and there is jainism jainism is not a god based religion and within hinduism sankhya the sankhya philosophy is not god based um, even the nyaya philosophy no sorry even the um, the yoga philosophy which talks about ishvara that ishvara is not the ishvara of uh, of you know theistic religions or the ishvara of vedanta also that ishvara in yoga is not the creator preserver destroyer of the world uh, it is a powerful enlightened being who can help us towards enlightenment that much uh, in yoga philosophy so there are strong traditions within hinduism which are non theistic so there are two kinds of approaches possible one is around the theistic god centered approach one characteristic of the god centered approach is they are devotional and you will see it is easy to identify there will be temples churches mosques synagogues there will be songs and recitations and worship lots of ritual food and uh, nice music all of that is there i'm making very broad statements general statements uh, if you contrast it with the uh, non theistic religions like buddhism jainism you will find there is a tendency towards in buddhism jainism not so much um, you know external observances as the tendency towards meditation for example uh, philosophical discussion for example they are more introverted kind of path of religion again general observance you said swami haven't you seen the magnificent chinese buddhist temples of course there are so all of these over thousands of years they have become very popular practices so there is a you know there's a demand in the human heart for ritual and some place for prayer so god is removed and buddha is put in the god's plane god's place so that happens but in general you will see i'm making a general statement here um and you will see the two kinds of people take to it i have seen so the young monks whom i used to teach so imagine so these are people who have come only for spirituality now there are also you see two different kinds one kind was very fond of going to the temple of sri ramakrishna the wonderful uh, you know the bhajans and kirtans uh, some loved doing the puja uh, they were very devotional you would see the care with which they decorated their own personal set of pictures of thakur ma swami ji and so that is a devotional approach it is something from the heart that pulls them and there is another group who would do all that but you can see primarily they would be always buzzing around the library and they would be sitting for long hours in meditation they would be most um, active in the vedanta classes and you know asking questions and arguing with each other that's another kind of approach self inquiry if you ask and i i sometimes did those young men why have you come what are you trying to do here being a monk some would say i have come for god realization good others would say that i have come for self realization who am i so what about god oh, god is nice good i am really uh, i will be very glad to meet him i'm joking but uh, their attitude was really they are interested in this who am i into, into what am i what exactly am i um so these are the two kinds and if we look at ourselves we'll see we are most of us will be a mix of both uh, but we'll clearly have a tendency towards one or the other and i suspect i suspect because you're all here in a vedanta class a bhagavad gita class and vedanta class uh, it is quite possible that uh, you are more on the self inquiry path uh, than the purely devotional path though it's a bhagavad gita class so bhagavad gita is also fully devotional so a person who is completely a devotee also can be happily in the bhagavad gita class but i would suspect more 
the Wednesday classes and the um, you know the Upanishads and Vedanta Sar they tend to attract more of the self inquiry type of personality. They have their advantages and disadvantages. I'll touch upon it quickly and move on to the uh, new chapter. What are the advantages and disadvantages? Um, the that centered religion, God centered religion, God based religion has one huge disadvantage. Huge disadvantage is it's based on faith, on belief. So ultimately, of course, you can have God realization and mystical experiences of God. It's all possible, but that's the end of the road. You can't begin with that. You have to begin with faith, and for a long time, your path in religion has to be sustained by belief, by faith. If you start by questioning and start by asking awkward questions, it won't work. And that's why in this country, notice so interesting, religion is called faith. Religion is called faith. It's uh, they used as synonyms in USA. What is your faith? That seems reasonable to ask, but it's not a reasonable thing to ask if you are following Sankhya or Advaita. Uh, what is your faith? It's not a faith as such. So uh, the big problem with the path of belief in God is it is belief. If you have it, good. But the problem with the having it also is that it can be attacked. And it can be attacked from outside. It can be attacked from inside. That I've heard it sometimes. I prayed and prayed and prayed and then something very bad happened or what I wanted did not happen. Now I don't believe in those things anymore. God made me happy. I believe in God. God made me sad. I no longer believe in God. God is fired. From his position here, he was supposed to make my life better, didn't With poor performance, laid off. So, that what happened if internally itself, I lost my faith in God, I lost belief in God. So, can't that thing happen in uh, say Vedanta or in Sankhya? It can't. If I am happy, good, the same awareness is revealing the happiness. If I'm miserable, okay, what can I do? <laughs> Same awareness is revealing the misery in me. My... I can't deny a fact. Whether it doesn't depend on my opinion, it does not depend on my mood, it does not depend on which book I've if I read a new book with new theories, it still is the same consciousness which reveals this book and its theories. It's undeniable fact. So faith-based, that's the problem. Whereas that problem is not there, for example. Uh, in the self-inquiry based religions like Buddhism, for example, or Sankhya. Um, in in uh, those religions, in the self-inquiry based religion, nobody ever doubts, do I exist? In the God-based religions, you can always question, does God exist? Prove the existence of God. One of the greatest endeavors in all the devotional religions, all the dual dualistic religions of the world, you will always find there will be theologians and philosophers who have struggled and struggled to exist prove the existence of God. Not with much success, but the very struggle, the very effort shows that there is always an anxiety about it. Always. If you have seriously committed yourself to religion, then you will always be anxious. Am I following something real or is it just a fairy tale? Maybe the atheists are right. Maybe Richard Dawkins is right. Maybe um, what's his name? Christopher Hitchens or... Uh, um, Daniel Dennett or Sam Harris, they're right. Maybe there's no God. Am I on a fool's errand? But that doubt, anxiety will always be there. And you'll find Thomas Aquinas, um, who gives the five proofs of the existence of God in Christian theology. The great Nayaika, Hindu um, logician, Udayana, Udayana Acharya, arguing against the Buddhists who are attacking his concept of God, gives nine proofs of the existence of God and so on. This very attempt continuously struggle and trying to reason and establish God through reason is shows the anxiety that uh, it is always subject to doubt. Not only that, even more serious, uh, you are, um, when you are pursuing, say, a seriously, a spiritual path based on faith and only on faith, then even at an advanced level, you may still get be tormented by doubts. Sometimes you'll feel the presence of God and you'll be filled and you'll be, feel sublime. Sometimes that presence will be withdrawn. You see it in the, the records of the mystics all the time. 
I feel an emptiness, a vacuum, a darkness. Mother Teresa's last records. I pray and pray and pray. There is only silence in return. How, how sh- um, terrible it can be. You know? After a lifetime of devotion, suddenly you feel that. Not that she actually lost faith or anything like that. But one goes through these phases, these tremendous ups and downs. You can't do that, for example, in Advaita Vedanta. As Shankaracharya says, once you have raised as much doubt as you can about the existence of Atma, Brahma, consciousness, it is by consciousness alone that doubt will be revealed. The very doubting will prove <laughs> that consciousness exists. Huh, about the nature of consciousness, see, even there, one may doubt. The infinite consciousness without beginning and end, unchangeable, that is a matter of faith. No, no, no. It's a matter of understanding. All right. So this is the problem with the... Um, faith-based approach with the uh, self-inquiry based approach this problem is not there because nobody seriously doubts whether I exist or not nobody in fact my own existence is the problem I exist and I have a hundred one one problems and that's why I have come to spiritual life I have so many problems I am miserable my relationships are giving me uh, sadness I am poor I am sick I'm getting old I'm lonely um, the stock market is crashing, Omicron is coming, so many things. These are all my problems. They, clearly, I exist. It would have been a blessing if I did not exist, but I surely do exist because it's all these problems are proving my existence. So my existence is not in doubt. The, this path is not open to doubt. In fact, the existence itself is, is the problem here. All right. But the path of faith, God-based approach, has an advantage, which this other approach does not. God, if God exists, God has no problem. We will just see from the next seven, six chapters. God is extraordinary, omniscient, omnipotent, om- omnipresent. God is full of glories. God has no problem at all. God's existence is an entirely problem-free, glorious existence, if God exists. We exist without any doubt. But our existence is beset with problems. Now what Advaita Vedanta does is this. I'll bring in Advaita Vedanta here. What Advaita Vedanta does is it says, your existence and God's existence are one and the same thing. Tattva Masi. You are that reality. So the beauty of this approach is it takes the indubitable, absolute certainty of your own existence and combines it with the infinitude of God's existence. So you have an absolutely certain, indubitable, unshakable, infinite existence. If you think about it, it's a stunning achievement. You have to appreciate the dualistic approach, devotional approaches, the Buddhistic approach, Sankhyan approach, and then see the genius of the Advaitic thing. What does Advaita do in all its uh, methods, um, waking, dreaming, deep sleep analysis, seer and seeing discernment? First, it isolates you in your real nature, witness consciousness. Then it shows you the infinitude of that witness consciousness and the problem-free nature of that witness consciousness. That is freedom. Um, All right. Now, is it necessary? Then the seventh... uh, the seventh chapter to twelfth chapter, um, devotion is it necessary? Well, let me say first of all, necessary or ne- not necessary, we'll see next. But first of all, it is definitely a, pla- a part of classical Advaita Vedanta. In every text of classical Advaita Vedanta, more or less, Ishwara will make an appearance. And devotion to Ishwara will be taught. Upasana, the worship of Ishwara will be taught. The importance of the grace of Ishwara, the most radical, radical text of non-dualism. It seems to have no place for God or world or anything. Just even more than Ashtavakra is the Avadhuta Gita. And it, the first verse of the Avadhuta Gita is Ishvara Anugraha Deva Pumsam Advaita Vasana. It is by the special grace of Ishvara that we have individual seekers, we have this desire for Advaita, this liking for non-duality. Where does it come from? It comes by a special grace of God. It is a great, great blessing to have the liking for non-duality. 
So, worship of Ishwara, belief in God, faith in God, is certainly a part of Advaita Vedanta, traditional Advaita Vedanta. In all the Advaita matters, the mon monasteries you go, you will find a worship of, generally a worship of Shiva. In Kailash Ashram, I've gone, which is this is like a stronghold of non-dual philosophy in the Himalayas. Daily morning, two things are compulsory there. Two things are compulsory if you go and stay there. One is early in the morning, you will uh, come for the Mangalarati the, of, of uh, Abhinava Chandraeshwara, the uh, Shiva who is worshipped in that ashram. And the second thing compulsory is you must attend the classes, there, Vedanta classes. You must turn up for class. Otherwise, you are not allowed to stay in the ashram. Turn up for the worship of Shiva, turn up for the class. Food is uh, uh, optional. If you, you, they know you're going to turn up for food anyway. So it is part of classical Advaita Vedanta. Shankara is, Shankaracharya himself is the source of some of the most uh, sublime devotional hymns in Hinduism. We have this Tavananjali collection of Sanskrit hymns published by our Nagpur Ramakrishna mission. I was one day seeing hymns for the last 5,000 years, a 5,000 year old religious culture. All the collections of the hymns there, worships of various gods and goddesses, they are all forms of Saguna Brahman, Ishwara. Fully one third of the hymns written by one man. In 5,000 years of religious literature, the best ones have been picked out. And out of the best ones, one third are by one person. Shankaracharya, the great non-dualist. Worship of Divine Mother, Durga, Kali, uh, worship of Shiva, uh, of uh, Vishnu, of Rama, of Krishna, uh, of Ganga. So all of them, uh, beautiful hymns have been written by Shankaracharya. So traditionally, Advaita Vedanta fully accepts, supports, encourages the worship of Saguna Brahman, Ishwara. All right. Still, the question persists. You are ava avoiding... If I push hard, Swami, will you say, is it absolutely necessary to have a belief in God for becoming enlightened in the non-dual philosophy of Advaita Vedanta? I have to be honest and say no. You need not. Your self-inquiry itself can lead you to enlightenment. After all, if uh, religions like Buddhism or Jainism can lead to enlightenment without taking the help of God, I mean, without uh, belief in God. So it should be possible. Uh, so it is possible. And for those uh, few who have an objection, I don't like all this God stuff. Uh, so they need not go through you know, holding on to the this God paradigm. Uh, the view of Sri Ramakrishna, Swami Vivekananda is very clear. Nothing is rejected. All of it is taken. And the belief in God, yes. It is belief. Yes, it is faith. It is devotion. Uh, it is highly recommended. You said, how can you recommend belief? If I don't have belief, if just by recommending, will I start believing? You can try. You can, uh, you can start mechanically doing You will see very soon how it becomes an integral part of your life. A little worship, a little devotional music, a little, just uh, even mechanically also. Uh, mantra, Japa of Ishta Devata, you will see very soon it will become a very precious part of your life and daily routine. All right, that's all. Um, let me make a beginning. I think the comments are already there. The seventh chapter. Uh, it is called Jnana Vijnana Yoga, the yoga of knowledge and uh, special knowledge. Jnana and Vijnana. So how can I translate Vijnana? Special knowledge or higher knowledge, supreme knowledge. Shri Bhagavan Uvacha Maya Sakta Manah Partha Yogam Yunjan Madashraya Asamshayam Samagrammam Yatha Gyasya Sitat Srinu The Blessed Lord said, Listen how with the mind intent on me, taking refuge in me, and practicing yoga, O Partha Arjuna, you will know me in full, free from doubt. Straight away, coming to the point, God. And God is himself saying, worship me, right away. Beginning of the seventh chapter. Maya um, Sakta Mana. 
keeping your mind or keep the seeker keeps his or her mind on god and this has two components one is one must make a firm resolution god realization is my goal what is my um, purpose in life um, you see is it the world or is it god one sadhu in uttarakhand is nicely used to say bhav kya hai batao bhav kya hai batao bhav means it's very difficult to translate bhav bhav means your attitude uh, it it means what you really want in really really want in life not your christmas list inside what pulls you um what is your tendency this swami has passed i can take his name ramananda saraswati so he used to say in every human being there are three streams three streams karma dhara gyana dhara bhava dhara three streams the stream of action the stream of knowledge and the stream of bhava i'm not translating bhava bhava just the tendency very nature of a person what is karma dhara that's what you do are you an engineer are you a homemaker are you a teacher what you do karma dhara gyana dhara what you know so this swami used to say humko usse koi dilchaspi nahi hai koi matlab nahi hai i have no interest in knowing what you do in life people used to go to him you know i am an engineer or i work here or i do this he would say humko koi dilchaspi i have no interest i have no interest even in knowing what you know what degrees you have got or even if you have attended all vedanta classes you have got a whole vedanta library and memorized so many things um that also i don't want to know what you know i also that also i'm not interested bhav kya hai batao tell me what is your intent within so maya sakta mana parta where your mind is flowing naturally what does it want in our deepest moments secret moments let it go and see not once or twice many thoughts can come lot of rubbish may come up all the time in general where is it going what does it really hanker after in life so it will definitely be worldly things for all of us you will see it will be a mixture we really really want to be spiritual but we really want certain things in the world to be nicer or better but that spiritual part must be there that is bhav and they say the saying is whatever one's bhav is that one will be that one will get in this life and next life want the world you'll get the world you want god you will get god and there's beautiful stories about it also um that uh, um let me give the two meanings of maya uh, sakta mana they'll tell you the story the one meaning is so bhav what does one really want make up your mind i am all about god realization that is one part of it the second part of keeping your mind on me krishna says is that yes you have made up your mind that god realization is your goal but from moment to moment day to day where is your mind what are you thinking about i my aim is god realization but what am i thinking about oh the paying the bills collecting donations for the ashram uh, and uh, you know uh, what's the, what what the next meal is going to come from if this is the thing the, you are your aim is god realization you are thinking about the world so not only your aim should be god realization bhava but your day to day thinking should mostly flow towards god and that will happen if the bhava is really there if i really want something not only will i work towards it not only will it be my goal but i'll keep thinking about it also where your um, where treasure is there your heart will be also jesus says no man can worship uh, god and mammon together god and world you can't worship them together where your treasure is there your heart will be so if my treasure i think these things in the world are my treasure this is what i have really achieved in the world then my heart will be there not so much with god even god will be employed to protect this thing the other way around if i love god and i want god all of what i have in life will be there to help me to go godwards and the loss of things in the world is also no no problem for me often it's a great freedom okay couple of stories this bhav this one story will do i think um it is the story you know we are, we are coming to the birthday of ma sharada holy mother sharada devi so the story is about her birthplace 
there is an ashram in a remote village in Bengal called Jairambati. So that was that's where she was born. Now a monk there told me this story that long ago when he was a young newcomer to the monastery, there used to be a sweeper, a very humble old man who would come and sweep the ashram and work and then go. Very quiet. When he was old and not very well able to, uh, able to work, the monks in the ashram told him, um, you need not come. Go take rest in, at your home and we'll send you the, your pension. It's difficult for you and you're not doing any way, any way doing a good job of it. Then that old man told a very touching story. He said, I'm not doing it for the money you give me, oh good swamis. You know why I'm doing it? Long, long ago, he was a very old man. Long, long ago, long before you were born, I used to come here and play in this place. This was the mother's house. She was here at that time. I used to watch from a distance. I was too shy to go up to her. And all these big people used to come from Calcutta, and devotees. And they would come and their mother would initiate them. Some of them would get extraordinary experiences, you know, visions of God or ecstasies. And I would watch. So one day I you know, got up enough courage when the mother was sitting alone, I went up to her and said, Mother, won't I get anything? Okay. Then she said to me immediately, she took it seriously. She said to me, why won't you, my dear? You do one thing. You do what you are doing. Uh, he, he used to uh, sweep the uh, ashram and you know, maybe his father was also a sweeper. So he used to come with his father or something. You do what you're doing. Keep coming and keep keep doing that. That's all. And you will get everything. And he, then he said, Swami, that is what I have been doing all my life. I believed her and I've been doing it all my life. And I do it for her. So many decades ago, uh, this old lady asked me to do it. And that's why I'm doing it. Not for your, your salary or your the money that you gave me. So as long as he was able to work, he, he worked. And this monk told me one day he did not come. And his daughter came and she started sweeping the ashram and they asked her, what happened to your father? He's too sick. Um, he's dying. He cannot get up. So the monks said that we'll go and visit him. And they visited him in his humble little hut. And his passing was so remarkable. He had a vision of the Divine Mother at the moment of death. And he said, Mother, you have not forgotten me. You promised you have come for me. And he said, don't you all see? She has come. Put, put a, like a mat, asan means a mat for her sitting. Anyway, nobody else saw that, of course, but he could see and he passed. That is bhava. What is the karma dhara? What is the action does he you know, is doing? Very uh, humble, very mean thing, just um, sweeping. What is his jnana dhara, the stream of knowledge? Hardly anything. I, I, I suspect he was maybe a school dropout or an illiterate. But his bhava was, I want God realization. Even as a child, he asked the mother, not for sweets, which all the Calcutta people were bringing. As a child, he could have asked that. Not for uh, uh, money, um, not for a nice dhoti. He asks for God as a little child. Uh, what a remarkable thing. And uh, she gives him the sadhana. And what is the sadhana? spiritual practice? Not uh, seer and seeing the five levels of being or the waking, dreaming, deep sleep or nirvikalpa samadhi. Um, no. Sweep the, uh, you know, the dust away from, from the front of the temple. That's all. So it's an important lesson. God does not depend on our techniques. So all that we will see soon. Um, all right, one more story came to my mind. It's related to this. Um, there was, in Calcutta, when the mother went to Calcutta, when she stayed there, uh, one young man who would come and help in the ashram there. I forget his name. His name was probably Chandra. Uh, but anyway. So this ma young man was very simple. Every day, and he, he really served the Holy Mother a lot. and to do a lot of work in the ashram. Every day he would go upstairs and after the Holy Mother finished her puja, she would offer him sandesh. You know the Bengali milk sweet sandesh? He would offer that to him. 
which was offered in uh, as uh, in the puja and it was prasad and he would ask for that uh, sandesh and he would take the sandesh and come down happily munching it now the monks they teased him no end uh, one uh, monk said oh what a, what a fool you are you getting this tremendous opportunity to serve the holy mother look we are all here for for you know enlightenment god realization <laughs> we're doing so many spiritual practices but she can give you that straight away and you are such a fool you keep asking for a sandesh for a sweet just ask her for enlightenment for god realization and uh, the story is so stunning you know so he decides all right i'll do that if i ask her will she give it to me no of course so they you know they put him up to it the next day he went up and uh, uh, he was standing there as she finished the uh, puja and he he says, says later as he climbed the stairs that day everything was different he says my heart was pounding and my hands and feet became cold and i stood there i couldn't say anything she looked at me and she said yes what do you want and he said i, I couldn't say anything and she said softly what do you want my child tell me and he said sandesh <laughs> and she gave him that little sweet and he ran out he just literally ran away from there in fear see he couldn't ask so of course he had full blessings of the mother he served the mother so much i'm sure he would have become enlightened but the remarkable thing about that little boy he asks for god realization as a little boy just like nachiketa you know you reminded me during the kato upanishad like that so this is the maya sakta manah partha yogam yunjan ah so you've taken refuge in god we don't have to do any practice he said no you have to do all the practices all the yogas practicing yoga which yoga all the yogas have taught you do your karma yoga do your regular meditation study your vedanta and one more thing he's adding so he's then what's new here he's adding the next new thing powerful madashraya take refuge in me it's something that uh, we often make a mistake about either we are very eager we'll learn this technique we'll go to that swami we'll attend that youtube lecture or that seminar and we'll amass so many notes and um and uh, recordings and techniques and we are up and doing good but we forget the 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 hidden factor god it all ultimately depends on god's grace so that's one big mistake we make we forget god's grace the other mistake is a kind of laziness it all depends on god's grace and it doesn't really matter what i do no it does because krishna himself is saying very clearly Uh, yogam yunjan at the very least this indicates your intention you are trying means you are in, you are showing god that you want god you don't try nothing knock and it shall be opened but you have to knock so yogam yunjan pl- please practice your spiritual disciplines but also madashraya taking refuge in god all along everything you offer it back to god because everything that we get out of the spiritual practices is only by the grace of god nothing is possible without the grace of god even the greatest of practices will ultimately give results only by the grace of god there was um, a monk in banaras when swami turiyananda ji was there there in his old age in the in the hospital there so there is a reminiscence about him that a monk not a monk belonging to our order he was somebody who stayed in a little hut by the bank of the ganga so this monk very austere he was highly regarded among the monks for his um, severe austerities his extreme uh, renunciation his his tremendous self control he was a mauni he would never speak he would never speak he would never go anywhere except that he would come to swami turiyananda he would go to the temple of shiva but he would come to swami turiyananda who was not even a monk of his order so the swami and the swami swami turiyananda loved this monk a lot this um, quiet austere uh, monk a lot and there's a beautiful description of uh, him this monk sitting at the feet of swami turiyananda not speaking he would not speak to anybody not even to swami turiyananda 
and it is so touching his his hands are out like this he is asking for something he knows swami turiyananda can give it to him and swami turiyananda with great compassion he says my child you have done so much now leave it learn to leave it to the divine mother see that's one lesson he he would not accept and that you know i've done it so this result i will get and he's clear i'm doing so much more than everybody else but swami turiyananda says one more thing you have he says you have done so much my child i agree but now leave it to the divine mother so this madashaya the grace of god asamshayam samagram mam yatha gyasya si tatshrinu so beyond any doubt totality you will learn totality means what here um it means shankara and also madhusudan number of uh, commentators have said so the the god of religion krishna who is the incarnation of that god or vishnu whatever the god of religion you will get my vision and you will also realize that you are brahman the highest realization both you will realize by my grace this is the importance of worshiping saguna brahman saguna brahman has the power to remove the obstacles which stand between us and enlightenment all the knowledge is given to us you attend you take any one vedanta textbook something as small as drig drishya viveka whatever you need to know has been given there then why are we not enlightened yet the problem does not lie in the knowledge problem hopefully does not lie in the teacher also the problem lies in our own men- in mind in our sukshma sharira in our mind that has that is cleared up by uh, ishwara by ishwara's grace takes a little bit of time little bit of effort again jesus says it best he says that my burden my yoke is light come ye all that are heavy laden in samsara you are under great burden shake it up take it off means it will all be there but now you all surrender it to god come and take refuge in god and god says i will also put a burden on you i'll put a yoke on you but it'll be a light yoke there'll be something that you'll have to do for god for god means god doesn't need our service at all it's our purification will be done it will be our sadhana and he says that will be a very light thing compared to the struggle you are in in samsara and then samagram whole thing you will get you will get the vision of god you will feel the presence of god like any devotee any bhakta and you will ultimately get enlightenment i am brahman both you will get by my grace he says how he says tat shrinu this is very good advertisement for this chapter he says i am going to tell you that now how all this is going to happen verse number 2 we'll do this much gyanam teham savigyanam idam vaksham्yasheshat yad gyatva neha bhuyanyat gyatabhyam avashishyate i shall tell you without reserve about this knowledge gyana together with realization vigyana knowing which there remains nothing further to be known here so i'm going to tell you gyana knowledge vigyana special knowledge supreme knowledge higher knowledge and after this nothing more will remain to be known this is the final thing the very beautiful verse and this is where the chapter has taken its name gyana vigyana yoga this chapter is called the chapter the yoga of gyana and vigyana knowledge and supreme knowledge what is this knowledge and supreme knowledge there is the difficulty if you go to the commentators there are various commentaries shankara acharya shridhar swami they are very clear um gyana here knowledge means that which comes from the study of the scriptures shastra gyan you go to a teacher study the upanishads the gita the various texts of vedanta brahma sutras and so on you will get a general understanding of who am i the ultimate reality that is gyana but to make it a living realization shankara acharya says anubhava that is called vigyana the direct living realization i am brahman aham brahmasmi satyam gyanam anantam brahma infinite existence consciousness is brahman great no 
you have missed it what is meant there is infinite consciousness existence i am infinite consciousness existence is meant for you you are that infinite existence consciousness you do not die you are not born you do not die you are one in all bodies and minds that that extraordinary radiant being you already are and all this sounds fantastic um, uh, you know like science fiction or fantasy or something the fact that it sounds like science fiction fantasy to, to us is is it shows us it is not a living reality for us yet for an enlightened person and say yes but a bright smile the person will say yes of course it is true it's true of me it's true of you also the only difference enlightenment makes is the enlightened person will say i know it and you do not that does not make you any less god than i am there is one divinity everywhere realizing which nothing more remains to be realized once you realize that then you see everything else in this universe is an appearance in that one consciousness if after realizing that don't i need to know how to cook and go to science class to learn science and uh, how to treat the covid virus yes all those things one learns on the vyavaharika transactional plane but that it is a transactional plane that it is the plane of appearance that it is the plane of the movie that becomes clear and that the reality is not affected by all of this and you are that reality that becomes very clear life will go on yes you will treat the covid virus you will cook your next meal fine you will do it with great joy because those are all appearances manifestations of god alone is a wonderful thing it's not that life will become boring oh i know everything to be known there's nothing more to be known can i cancel my library membership no and that's not what is meant here in the transactional plane life will continue as it is but you have known the reality behind it and that makes a huge huge difference you have known that it's not a nightmare it's a lucid dream i mean it's it's not a real thing not a real real uh, um, tragedy it's like a lucid dream or it's like a movie it's like a work of art or fiction and you are the reality there so at a deep level your problems will all, will be solved completely then this little drama of this one little particular life you can lead out live live out uh, happily the body is aging wonderful body is sick and dying can you say wonderful when the body is sick and dying yes i know of um, uh, uh, you know highly spiritual people who found it fun when the body is sickening literally on the verge of death they burst out laughing and the, the attendant is telling this the, the monk who is laughing like that said swami don't do that you must tell the doctor where it hurts otherwise the doctors can't if you're giggling the doctors can't teach you i like can't treat you they won't understand what to do he said isn't it hurting bed sores you know the point of death they're cleaning the bed sores yeah. so isn't it hurting and he says yes of course it's hurting it's hurting hurting it's burning terribly and why are you giggling see it is such great fun <laughs> like sri ramakrishna he says great fun he didn't say the uh, hari marat saw him and i see that you are in great fun that means sri ramakrishna saying it's so so much pain so both are true equally true no 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 the spiritual truth that you are brahman that is the truth this is the rest of it the pleasure and the pain just the play just the movie just the work of art for you don't tell others a person who is not enlightened who is suffering don't tell him it's a work of art that you are suffering <laughs> that is that's crazy and the enlightened person will always have tremendous sympathy just look at the lives of the saints they have tremendous sympathy for everybody one more thing point and i'm done and this gyana and vigyana as i said there are multiple interpretations sri ramakrishna gave a more advanced interpretation he says no no gyana the first one is not just knowledge from the books it is enlightenment i am brahman realize that then vigyana is a deeper uh, um, enlightenment where everything that you had left behind every bit of it is realized as god as brahman 
So he gave multiple examples. He said, walking up the stairs of the, of the building, you leave behind the first floor, the second floor, you leave behind the staircase, the doors, and they go to the rooftop. And there you realize what the rooftop is made of, the concrete, the bricks, and the wood, the staircase, and the doors, and the first floor, second floor, they're all made of the same stuff. So what you have left behind in, in the world, body, mind, of this exter external world, and you've discovered that radiance which underlies everything, and I am that, but that radiance alone appears in all of these. Nothing, including the body also. I'm much vilified, I'm not the body, I'm not the body. The body will feel hurt if you keep saying I'm not the body. But you realize then, this body, all the bodies in the physical world down to um, you know, a grain of dust. It's true and true, nothing but God. So that is called Vijnana. Another example he gives is milk. So, um, there's somebody who's just heard of milk, that there's such a thing as milk, and read about it. So That's the person who has just read a book. That person can be easily confused. Um, Ramananda Saraswati gave an example, how such a person can be easily confused. It's a person who has read about milk, but he doesn't know, I've never seen it. And somebody asks him, what color is milk? And he says, I heard it's white. And then the, that person who's playing a prank on him says, you're right, but that's partial knowledge. The complete knowledge is the milk from white cows is white, milk from brown cows is brown, and milk from black cows is black. And this man thinks that sounds reasonable, actually. Yeah, maybe the book was incomplete, you know, white cows, white, yeah, that's right. Now, if you have seen what is milk, you will say it doesn't matter whether the cow is uh, black or white or red or brown, milk is white. So, there is the person who has just read it. That can, person can be easily confused. Now, Sri Ramakrishna says, there is a person who has seen milk. So, he knows what is milk. He says, it's white and I've seen it. That's the person who has got jnana, who realizes Brahman is there. And um, at the deepest level, I and Brahman are one. Uh, that itself is a wonderful thing. It's, it's uh, a very freeing thing to have. Even if you have um, just the conviction about it. At a deep level, you'll be fine in the ups and downs of life. But that's not enough. So Ramakrishna says there is, a, there is this other person who has not only seen that the milk, but has drunk the mi milk and has tasted the milk and has um, digested the milk and has become, um, you know, hunger is uh, satiated and has become nourished and strong by drinking the milk. This is one is intimate with Brahman, is, um, is you know, everywhere and everything, is always immersed in God. That is Vijnana. So that also is there. And you know, um, our Ayan Maharaj, Swami Medhananda, has made this the central plank of his book, Infinite Paths to Infinite Reality, about Sri Ramakrishna, the, the whole Vijnana thesis. So Jnana Vijnana, these two terms uh, are... Uh, interesting. Okay. Let me quickly look at the questions. Rick says, you have covered this Vedansa and I forgot, but how do we know that that refers to Saguna Brahman and Nirguna Brahman? Yes, the definitions. Um, in uh, Vedanta Sara, there is a whole chapter Mahavakyartha Vichara, the analysis of the meaning of the Mahavakya, Tattvamasi. There each of the terms is defined. What are the definitions? Tat refers to Samashti Agyana Avachinna Chaitanya, consciousness limited by Maya, that is Ishwara or Saguna Brahman. Tvam refers to uh, Vyashti Agyana Avachinna Chaitanya, consciousness limited by a fragment of Maya, a little bit of ignorance. That is our individual sentient being, the causal body of each of us. So these are very precisely defined in Vedanta Sara. And this is the classical Vedanta approach. There is God of the universe. There is you. You and God are ultimately the same. Not as you, the individual, not as God, as God. Then you are vastly different. This is where the dualists who become very furious at us, the non-dualists, they say that you are sacrilegious fellows. You are equating yourself to Krishna. You miserable little creature and you think you are God, you are Vishnu, you are Krishna, you are Shiva. Of course not. But that's not what Advaita is saying. When Shankara sings, Chidananda Rupa Shivoham, 
I am Shiva, I am Shiva. He does not mean Shiva sitting on the Mount Kailasha with a, a, sna- with a hairdo of snakes and the, the Ganga coming out of his uh, top knot and the moon on his forehead. That is a depiction of Saguna Brahman, Ishwara. What he means is, just before that, what does Shankaracharya say? Chidananda Rupaha Shivoham Shivoham. As pure consciousness, as bliss. So I am not this person called Shankara. I am not even God, Shiva. I am this infinite, unlimited bliss consciousness, which is the core of Shiva, which is also my core. We are one there. Sangeeta says, Continuing further from Prabhupada's Baba's question, in this framework, would you say there is no difference between Sarguna Brahman of, uh, Advaita, uh, Avatar, of Advaita and Avatar as known here? Uh, no difference means Avatar is not Saguna Brahman. Avatar is the Avatar of Saguna Brahman. God. Saguna Brahman is God. Avatar is incarnation. So Krishna is the incarnation of God. If not, why do we see a greater amount of Shakti uh, production attributed in Avatar like Krishna or Jesus versus, say, uh, Sri Ramakrishna? So, the Avatar has different kinds of Shakti. As I said, Avatar is incarnation. Incarnation is of God. And incarnations come with different roles. All right? So, they will have different displays of, uh, of powers. Bill, in Vedantic inquiry, a general faith that is a worthwhile enterprise is a prerequisite. Correct. That is called Shraddha. It is one of the qualities of the aspirant. But that, does that go against the thing that I said it's not a faith? No, not at all. The general faith, which is a prerequisite, pre- a prerequisite for all endeavors. Start a business, you must have faith that uh, your business commitments, your partners will honor it. You go to a, a university, you have faith that the uh, textbooks are not fake news and the uh, professors are not lying to you. That much faith you must have. That faith is necessary for continuing any endeavor. But it will not do in Advaita Vedanta to say that thou art and say, yes, sir, I believe it. You are great. You have said it, so I must be God. That won't work. You, you will have to uh, realize what it means. Isn't in initiation, taking initiation faith based? Absolutely. Mantra Diksha is faith-based. As I said, faith-based worship of uh, Saguna Brahman is not at all frowned upon in classical Advaita Vedanta. Generally, we start, Srinivas says, we start with devotion to God and gradually evolve to realize the identity of God with self. Yes, generally. And the other way around. I have seen it in my own experience. A lot of people who have interested in spirituality, but really, especially many young people, but really cannot bring themselves to the traditional ways of worshipping God, believing in God. They are attracted by the Advaitic teaching and then come to have a faith in God. <laughs> that has also happened. Some have taken Mantra Diksha after that. After being fascinated with Advaita, really liking Advaita, and once they begin to get an understanding of Advaita, they go on to take Mantra Diksha. Bill, what is the great disadvantage of Advaita? And no, nothing. It's a perfect system. The two sides have their disadvantages. The Tat side disadvantage is it's faith-based. If you criticize it, if you're skeptical, it won't work. The Tvam side, uh, the disadvantage is that uh, I exist, but my existence itself is uh, so limited. And that this I can be the unlimited uh, Brahman that it's so difficult to... Uh, understand, appreciate, or even conceive of. That's the problem of the self-inquiry approach. But Advaita combines the advantages of both without the disadvantages of either. Rama says, even the path of self-inquiry, at some point, the transient nature of the world becomes very clear and real. Infinite Atma is a kind of intellectual knowledge, and one is yet to get that breakthrough. There's an emptiness that prevails. Probably here, if we have God, it helps. Certainly, certainly it does. There's another way in which Bhakti helps. I'll take it up next time. It's an important topic. How Bhakti helps in self-inquiry. What is the real problem in self-inquiry? And Bhakti is a direct solution to that problem. I can mention it in just one sentence. Big problem in the initial stages of self-inquiry in Advaita is our desires which flow out to the world. I want this thing and that thing. I I have uh, vasanas for that. 
the cultivation of self knowledge can chip away can um, erode these desires but it's a slow and painstaking process you see uh, to put a very put it in a very simplistic way advait is working here and uh, desire is working here in the heart i want now this i want the world things in the world people in the world um, you know uh, honor and name and fame all of this in the world this i want this thing is gathered and then directed towards god and bhakti so instead of i want the world the same i want force is directed to god what happens is this force directed to god which becomes bhakti first of all it saves you from all the vasanas which drag you out to the world which makes advaita impossible and this not only it will save you from that nonsense it will become a, this devotion to god becomes an enormous uh, power in your uh, quest for self enlightenment on the uh, in the path of advaita so bhakti is a very very important thing it tackles the main problem which is left untouched in advaita vedanta which is the our usual desires which run out to the world our uh, uh, greed lust anger so why doesn't advaita tackle it notice advaita takes it for granted they have already tackled it the qualities of an aspirant the sadhaka sadhana chatushta advaita makes it an, an important part of the entry qualifications we jump over that and then later we complain advaita isn't working so the way to ta- tackle that is bhakti rik says shiva priya says as it is the same consciousness body and mind so brahma gyani can read others mind nope may be able to but may not be able to i'm giving it to you as an assignment work it out why this ability to know my own mind is it is of course because of consciousness but this ability that this is the thought in my mind where is it is it in mind or is it in consciousness that will give you the answer to your question jennifer says uh, rick says can't god eventually be experienced and thus be a hypothesis to be investigated empirically rather than something merely to be believed in absolutely that is what vivekananda brought into this age into this world into the west that is what he went the question he went with to uh, sri ramakrishna yes religion is not something to be believed in it is religion is realization he said if god exists i should be able to see god if i have an immortal soul i should be able to feel it religion is realization so yes uh, but for contrast i was making this distinction between the way theistic religions have been taught for a long time here is the teaching of the religious organization here is the teaching of the book and you just have to believe it Jennifer says doesn't vedantic teaching of tattva masi and all vedantic uh, teachings require faith prior to realization as we said faith means shraddha and that faith is what kind of faith is it it's a faith in the texts and in the teacher that there is something to it and i said it's the kind of faith you would have for any endeavor in the world you can't sign up for a course in physics in columbia university unless you have faith in the university in the professor in the textbook that much faith it's not difficult to have the feeling that we all have share it here there is something to this path which is really worthwhile and i'm going to pursue it that much is enough but what is required in the uh, dualistic religions an entirely different order altogether multiple things will you be asked to believe in heaven god um, um, you know um, pray to god god will appear before you and all those things which there is no direct proof as yet for you right now i think it was hume who said extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence this is where dualistic religions theistic religions fail or they are weak they don't fail but they become weak in in the face that's why they can't face up to the arguments of say someone like uh, richard dawkins for example gloria says one of jung's most important discoveries was this indwelling god image uh, within everyone mostly unconscious nature of this in a god image directs the life until it is made conscious beautiful i didn't know this but that's so true um this there is a concept in kashmiri shaivism abhinava gupta mentions it he says what is the difference between a devotee visualizing god say shiva in the heart and meditating and imagination 
a poet can imagine something, a novelist can imagine something, and your devotee is sitting and imagining Shiva in his heart. So what's the difference? And isn't it just imagination? What's the difference between Bhavana and Kalpana? These are two words in Sanskrit. So imagination is Spider-Man, Batman. Just because um, um, you know Marvel Comics imagines, it doesn't mean that they exist. If you're going to meditate on Spider-Man, will Spider-Man come? No. Then why, how is it different if you meditate on Krishna or Jesus or the Divine Mother? Because, Abhinava Gupta says, Bhavana is not imagination, or is not mere imagination. It is using the powers of imagination to grasp something which is already an existing reality which you do not see yet. What is the proof? Others have seen before you. Multiple times people have done it and it has been tested. And these are not wild imaginations. People have seen it in that way, in that form, using that name, with those glories. They have seen it. Follow that path. Use that form to visualize. Use these mantras. Meditate in the way the Guru has taught you. Yes, you are using imagination. But that imagination is a uh, pre-grasp on a reality. It will become real to you in time. So this is exactly what Jung, uh, bless his heart, who found out. Good. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Arpanamastu